Section 15 of Anecdotes of Dogs This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lydia Anecdotes of Dogs by Edward Jesse Chapter 15 The Terrier Part 1 Little favorite, rest thee here with the tribute of a tear. Thou hast fondled at my feet, greeted those I loved to greet. When in sorrow or in pain, on my bosom thou hast lain. I have seen thy little eye, full as with sympathy. There are so many varieties of terriers and so many celebrated breeds of these dogs, that it would be a difficult task to give a separate account of each. Some have a cross of the bulldog, and these perhaps are unequaled for courage and strength of jaw. In the latter quality, they are superior to the bulldog. Then there is the peppered and mustard breed, the Isle of Skye, the rough and smooth English terrier, and a peculiar breed, of which my own sensible little Judy, now reposing at my feet, is one, besides some others. Perhaps there is no breed of dogs which attach themselves so strongly to man as the terrier. They are his companions in his walks, and their activity and high spirit enable them to keep up with a horse through a long day's journey. Their fidelity to their master is unbounded, and their affection for him unconquerable. When he is ill, they will repose for hours by the side of his bed, as still as a mother watching over a sick and slumbering child. And when he is well... They will frisk around him as if their pleasure was renewed with his returning health. How well do I remember this to have been the case with my faithful old dog, Trim. Nothing would induce him to make the slightest noise till I called him on my bed when I awoke in the morning. Night or day, he never left me for many years. And when at last I was obliged to take a journey without him, his life fell a sacrifice to his affection for me. Alas, poor Trim! This breed of dogs, the true English terrier, shows an invincible ardor in all that he is required to do, as well as persevering fortitude. In drawing badgers and foxes from their holes, the severe bites of these animals only seem to animate them to greater exertions, and they have been known to suffer themselves to be killed by the former sooner than give over the unequal contest. The vignette at the end of this notice represents a favorite wire-haired terrier of mine called Peter well known for many years at Hampton Court. He had wonderful courage and perseverance and was the best dog to hunt rabbits in thick hedgerows I ever met with. He was also a capital water dog and he was frequently enticed by some of the officers quartered at Hampton Court to accompany them to the neighboring lock of the River Thames in which an unfortunate duck was to be hunted. I was assured that on these occasions Peter distinguished himself greatly, diving after the duck whenever it dived and beating all the other dogs by his energy and perseverance. Peter was a general favorite, and perhaps this was partly owing to his being a great pickle. He was always getting into scrapes. Twice he broke either his shoulder bone or his leg by scrambling up a ladder. 
He was several times nearly killed by large dogs, of which he was never known to show the slightest fear, and with those of about his own size, he would fight till he died. He has killed sixty rats in a barn in about as many minutes, and he was an inveterate foe to cats. I remember once taking him with me on a rabbit ferreting excursion. Before the ferrets were put in the holes, I made Peter quite aware that he was not to touch them, and he was so sensible a dog that there was no difficulty in doing this, although it was the first time he had seen a ferret. If a rabbit bolted from the hole he was watching, he killed it in an instant. But when the ferret made its appearance, Peter retreated a step or two, showing his teeth a little, as if he longed to attack it. Towards the end of the day, I had gone to a little distance, leaving Peter watching a hole. Presently, I heard a squeak, and on turning round, I saw the ferret dead and Peter standing over it, looking exceedingly ashamed at what he had done, and perfectly conscious that he had disobeyed orders. The temptation, however, was too great for him to resist. Peter at last got into bad company, for he suffered himself to be enticed by the ostlers and others, into the taps at Hampton Court, and they indulged him in his fondness for killing vermin and cats. He was a dog of extraordinary sense. I once gave him some milk and water at my breakfast, which was too hot. He afterwards was in the habit of testing the heat by dipping one of his paws into the basin preferring rather to scald his foot than to run the risk of burning his tongue. He had other peculiarities. When I mounted my horse and wanted him to follow me, he would come a little distance and then all at once pretend to be lame. The more I called, the lamer he became. He was, in fact, aware of my long rides and was too lazy to follow me. He played this trick very frequently. If I called him while I had my snuff-box in my hand, he would come to me, pretending to sneeze the whole of the time. I have said so much about Peter, because he was a good specimen of one of the small breed of terriers. Terriers, more than any other breed of dogs, live so much in our rooms and are so generally our companions during our walks and rides that they naturally imbibe a great degree of sensibility of the least look or word of their master. This very sensibility makes them extremely jealous of any preference or attention shown by their master to another dog. I had an old terrier who never could bear to see me do this. He showed it not only by his countenance in a remarkable way, but would fall upon any dog he saw me caress. Monsieur Blaise gives an instance of a dog having killed a young child who had been in the habit of fondling a dog belonging to the same owner, and showing fear and dislike of him. Another dog was so strongly attached to his master that he was miserable when he was absent. When the gentleman married, the dog seemed to feel a diminution of affection towards him and showed great uneasiness. Finding, however, that his new mistress grew fond of him, he became perfectly happy. Somewhat more than a year after this, they had a child. There was now a decided 
inquietude about the dog. And it was impossible to avoid noticing that he felt himself miserable. The attention paid to the child increased his wretchedness. He loathed his food, and nothing could content him. Though he was treated on this account with the utmost tenderness, at last he hid himself in the coal cellar, and every means were used to induce him to return, but all in vain. He was deaf to entreaty, rejected all kindness, refused to eat, and continued firm in his resolution, till exhausted, nature yielded to death. I have seen so much of the sensitiveness and jealousy of dogs, owing to their unbounded affection for their masters, that I cannot doubt the truth of this anecdote, which was related by Mr. Dibden. A lady had a favourite terrier, whose jealousy of any attentions shown to her by strangers was so great that in her walks he guarded her with the utmost care and would not suffer anyone to touch her. The following anecdote will prove the unchanging affection of these dogs. It was communicated to me by the best and most amiable man I have ever met with, either in public or private life. He had a small terrier, which was much attached to him. On leaving this country for America, he placed the dog under the care of his sister, who resided in London. The dog at first was inconsolable, and could scarcely be persuaded to eat anything. At the end of three years, his owner returned, and upon knocking at the door of his sister's house, the dog recognized the well-known knock, ran downstairs with the utmost eagerness, fondled his master with the greatest affection, and when he was in the sitting-room, the faithful animal jumped upon the pianoforte, that he might get as near to him as possible. The dog's attachment remained to the last moment of his life. He was taken ill, and was placed in his master's dressing-room on one of his cloaks. When he could scarcely move, his kind protector met him endeavouring to crawl to him up the stairs. He took the dog in his arms, placed him on his cloak. When the dog gave him a look of affection which could not be mistaken, and immediately died. There can, I think, be no doubt but that this affectionate animal, in his endeavour to get up the steps to his master, was influenced by sensations of love and gratitude, which death alone could extinguish, and which the approach of death prompted him to show. How charming are these instances of the affection of dogs to a kind master, and how forcibly may we draw forth the strongest testimonials of love from them, by treating them as they deserve to be treated. Few people sufficiently appreciate the attachment, fidelity, and sagacity of these too often persecuted animals, or are aware how much they suffer from unkindness or harsh treatment. Everyone is acquainted with the pretty picture Sir Walter Scott has drawn of the affectionate terrier, which was the companion of his hero in Guy Mannering. We see the faithful wasp scampering at large in a thousand wheels round the heath, and come back to jump up to his master and assure him that he participated in the pleasures of the journey. We see him during the fight with the robbers, annoying their heels and repeatedly effecting a moment's diversion in his master's favour and pursuing them when they ran away. We hear the jolly farmer exclaim, Deal, but your dugs will enter with the vermin. And when he goes to see his friend in prison and brings Wasp with him, 
we see the joy of the latter, and hear the remark elicited by it, Whisht, wasp, man! Well, be he's glad to see you, poor thing. The whole race of pepper and mustard are brought before us, that breed which are held in such high estimation, not only as vermin killers, but for their intelligence and fidelity and other companionable qualities. I could not deny myself the pleasure of introducing this account of the terrier, as it describes so well their courage, fidelity, and attachment. Wasp, we are told, at the close of an eventful day, crouched himself on the coverlet at his master's feet, having first licked his master's hand to ask leave. This is part of the natural language of the dog, and how expressive it is. They speak by their eyes, their tail, and by various gestures, and it is almost impossible to misunderstand their meaning. There is a well-known anecdote of two terriers who were in the habit of going out together to hunt rabbits. One of them got so far into a hole that he could not extricate himself. His companion returned to the house, and by his importunity and significant gestures, induced his master to follow him. He led him to the hole, made him understand what was the matter, and his associate was at last dug out. The following affords another proof of the sagacity of these dogs. A respectable farmer, residing in a village near Gosport, had a terrier dog who was his constant companion. His business frequently led him across the water to Portsmouth, to which place the dog regularly attended him. The farmer had a son-in-law, a bookseller at Portsmouth, to whose house he frequently went, taking the dog with him. One day, the animal, having lost his master in Portsmouth, after searching for him at his usual haunts, went to the bookseller, and by various gesticulations gave him to understand that he had lost his master. His supplications were not in vain, for the bookseller, who understood his language, immediately called his boy, gave him a penny, and ordered him to go directly to the beach and give the ferryman the money for his passage to the opposite shore. The dog, who seemed to understand the whole proceeding, was much pleased and jumped directly into the boat, and when landed at Gosport, immediately ran home. He always afterwards went to the bookseller, if he had lost his master at Portsmouth, feeling sure that his boat hire would be paid, and which was always done. The same dog, when he was wet or dirty, would go into the barn till he was clean and dry, and then scratch at the parlour door for admittance. The Reverend Leonard Janians, in his Observations in Natural History, records the following. A lady living in the neighbourhood of my own village had some years back a favourite Scotch terrier, which always accompanied her in her rides, and was also in the habit of following the carriage to church every Sunday morning. One summer day, the lady and her family were from home several weeks, the dog being left behind. The latter, however, continued to come to church by itself for several Sundays in succession, galloping off from the house at the accustomed hour so as to arrive at the time of service commencing. After waiting in the churchyard a short time, it was seen to return home, quiet and dispirited. The distance from the house to the church is three miles, and beyond that at which the ringing of the bells could be ordinarily heard. This was probably an instance of the force of habit, assisted by some association of recollections 
connected with the movements of the household on that particular day of the week. An old house being under repair, the bells on the ground floor were taken down. The mistress of the house had an old favorite terrier, and when she wanted her servants, sent the dog to ring the bell in her dressing room, having previously attached a bit of wood to the bell rope. When the dog pulled at the rope, he listened, and if the bell did not ring, he pulled till he heard it, and then returned to the room he had left. If a piece of paper were put into his mouth with a message written on it, he would carry it to the person he was told to go to, and waited to bring back the answer. Mr. Lang, who was steward to General Sharp of Houston near Uphall, had a terrier dog which gave many proofs of his sagacity. Upon one occasion, his wife lent a white petticoat to a neighbor in which to attend a christening. The dog observed his mistress make the loan, followed the woman home who had borrowed the article, never quitted her, but accompanied her to the christening and leaped several times on her knee, nor did he lose sight of her till the piece of dress was at last fairly restored to Mrs. Lang. During the time this person was at the christening, she was much afraid the dog would attempt to tear the petticoat off her, as she well knew the object of his attendance. One of the most extraordinary terriers I ever met with belonged to a man named T., well known for many years in the neighborhood of Hampton Court. The father of this man had been in a respectable way of life, but his son wanted steadiness of character and, indeed, good conduct, and had it not been for the kindness of his late majesty, King William the Fourth, he would have been reduced to poverty long before he was. T through the interest of the king, then Duke of Clarence, was tried in several situations, but failed in them all. At last he was made a postman, but was found drunk one evening, with all his letters scattered about him, and, of course, lost his situation. He then took up the employment of rat-catcher, for which perhaps he was better qualified than any other, his stock in trade consisted of some ferrets and an old terrier dog, and a more extraordinary dog was seldom seen. He was rough, rather strongly made, and of a sort of cinnamon color, having only one eye, his appearance being in direct contrast to what Bewick designates the genteel terrier. The other eye had a fluid constantly exuding from it, which made a sort of furrow down the side of his cheek. He always kept close to the heels of his master, hanging down his head and appearing the personification of misery and wretchedness. He was, however, a wonderful vermin killer, and wherever his master placed him, there he remained waiting with the utmost patience and resignation till an unfortunate rat bolted from the hole, which he instantly killed in a most philosophical manner. The poor dog had to undergo the vicissitudes of hard fare, amounting almost to starvation, of cold, rain, and other evils but still he was always to be seen at his master's feet, and his fidelity to him was unshaken. No notice, no kind word, seemed to have any effect upon him if offered by a stranger, but he obeyed and understood the slightest signal from his owner. This man was an habitual drunkard at least whenever he could procure the means of becoming one. It was a cold, frosty night in November, 
when T was returning from a favourite alehouse along one of the Thames Ditton lanes, some of which, owing to the flatness of the country, have deep ditches by their sides. Into one of these, the unfortunate man staggered in a fit of brutal intoxication and was drowned. When the body was discovered the next morning, the dog was seen using his best endeavours to drag it out of the ditch. He had probably been employed all night in this attempt, and in his efforts had torn the coat from the shoulders of his master. It should be mentioned that this faithful animal had saved his master's life on two former occasions, when he was in nearly similar circumstances. It may interest some of the readers of this little story to be informed that a few years before the event which has been related took place, the unhappy man's wife died, leaving four very young children. She was a most industrious woman, of excellent character, and her great misery on her deathbed was the reflection that these children, two boys and two girls, would be left to the care of her drunken husband. She was comforted, however, in her dying moments, by one whose heart and hand have always been ready to relieve the distressed, with the assurance that her children should be taken care of. So when the excellent Queen Adelaide heard of the circumstance, she immediately sent for the four children, placed them under the charge of a proper person, educated and maintained them, placed them in respectable situations in life, and continued to be their friend till her death. This is one of numerous instances which could be related by the author of Her Majesty's silent but unbounded benevolence. It is time, however, to resume my anecdotes of terriers. A gentleman of my acquaintance had a favourite dog of this description, which generally slept in his bedroom. My friend was in the habit of reading in bed. On calling upon him one morning, he took me into his bedroom and showed me his bed curtains much burnt and one of his sheets. The night before, he had been reading the newspaper in bed with a candle near him and had gone to sleep. The newspaper had fallen on the candle and thus set fire to the curtain. He was awoke by his dog scratching him violently with his forefeet, and was thus in time to call for assistance, and save the house from being burnt down, and also probably to save his own life. Another of my acquaintances has a very small pet terrier, a capital rat killer, who always evinces great antipathy to those animals. She lately produced three puppies, two of which were drowned. After hunting for them in every direction, she returned to her litter, where she was found the next morning not only suckling her own whelp, but a young rat, and thus she continued to do till it reached maturity. The morning on which her puppies were drowned, there had been a battle of rats, some of which were wounded and escaped. One of these latter was the young rat in question. This in no doubt was taken possession of for the purpose of relieving her of her superabundant milk. A gentleman who had befriended an ill-used terrier acquired such an influence over the grateful dog that he was obedient to the least look or sign of his master, and attached himself to him and his children in a most extraordinary manner. One of the children, having behaved ill, his father attempted to put the boy out of the room, who made some resistance. The dog, seeing the bustle, supposed his master was going to beat the boy, and therefore tried to pull him away by the skirts of his coat thus showing his affection and sagacity at the same time. Captain Brown relates the following. 
Sir Patrick Walker writes me, Pincer, in appearance, is of the English terrier breed, but in manner indicates a good deal of the Scotch collie, or shepherd's dog. He has a remarkably good nose, is a keen destroyer of vermin, and is in the habit of coming to the house for assistance ever since the following occurrence. He came into the parlour one evening when some friends were with us, and looking in my face by many expressive gestures, evinced great anxiety that I should follow him. Upon speaking to him he leaped, and his whine got to a more determined bark, and pulled me by the collar or sleeve of the coat, until I was induced to follow him. And when I got up, he began leaping and gambling before me, and led the way to an outhouse, to a large chest filled with pieces of old wood, and which he continued by the same means to solicit to be moved. This was done, and he took out a large rat, killed it, and returned to the parlour, quite composed and satisfied. Similar occurrences have frequently taken place since, with this addition, that as I sometimes called the servant, he often leaves me and runs in the same manner to get his assistance as soon as he finds me quitting the room to follow him. In no instance has Pincer ever been wrong. His scent is so very good. Once, when he had got assistance, he directed our attention to some loose wood in the yard, and when part of it was removed, he suddenly manifested disappointment and that the object of pursuit was gone. His manner and look seemed more than instinct, and at once told his story. After a little pause and some anxious looks, he dashed up a ladder that rested against a low outhouse and took a large rat out of the spout, whither it had apparently escaped whilst Pincer came for assistance. Terriers appear to have a strong instinctive faculty of finding their way back to their homes when removed from them to long distances, and even when they have ceased to cross. There are instances of their having done this from France, Ireland, and even Germany. Their powers of endurance, therefore, must be very great, and their energies as well as affections equally strong. They have also an invincible perseverance in all they do, to which every fox-hunter will bear his testimony. In my youth, when following the hounds, I have been delighted in witnessing the energy of a brace of terriers, who were sure to make their appearance at the slightest check, running with an ardour quite extraordinary, and incessant in their exertions to be with the busiest of the pack, in their endeavours to find. If the fox takes to earth, the little brave terrier eagerly follows, and shows by his baying whether the fox lays deep or not, so that those who are employed in digging it out can act accordingly. In rabbit shooting in thick furs or brakes, the terrier, as I have often witnessed, will take covert with the eagerness and impetuosity of a foxhound. On one of these occasions, I saw an enormous wild cat started, which a small terrier pursued and never quitted, notwithstanding the unequal contest, till it was shot by a keeper. As vermin killers, they are superior to all other dogs. The celebrated terrier Billy was known to have killed one hundred rats in seven minutes. Nor are their affections less strong than their courage. A gentleman in the neighborhood of Bath had a terrier which produced a litter of four puppies. He ordered one of them to be drowned, which was done by throwing it into a pail of water in which it was kept down by a mop till it appeared to be dead. 
It was then thrown into a dust hole and covered with ashes. Two mornings afterwards, the servant discovered that the bitch had still four puppies, and amongst them was the one which it was supposed had been drowned. It was conjectured that in the course of a short time, the terrier had, unobserved, raked her whelp from the ashes and had restored it to life. An excellent clergyman, residing close to Brighton, gave me the following curious anecdote of a dog which his son, the late greatly lamented Major R., brought to England with him from Spain. This dog was a sort of Spanish terrier, and his disposition and habits were very peculiar indeed, unlike those of any dog I ever heard of. One day, a teacher of music was going to one of her pupils, and as she was passing at some little distance from the house of the owner of this dog, had her attention attracted to him. He first looked at her very significantly, pulled her by the gown the contrary way to which she was going, and evidently wanted her to follow him. Partly instigated by curiosity, but chiefly because he held her gown tight in his mouth, she suffered herself to be led some distance, when the dog brought her into a field in which some houses were in the course of being built. She then became alarmed, and seeing two or three laborers, she asked them to drive away the dog. Finding, however, that he would not quit his hold, they advised her to see where the dog would lead her, promising to accompany and protect her. Thus assured, she allowed him to lead her where he pleased. The dog brought her to the houses which were being built. On arriving at them, it was found that the area had been dug out, and a strong plank placed across it, one end resting on a heap of earth. At this end, the dog began to scratch eagerly, and on the plank being lifted up, a large beef bone was discovered, which the dog seized in his mouth and trotted away with it perfectly satisfied. My informant said that he had taken some pains to ascertain the accuracy of this anecdote from the young lady herself, and that I might depend on its truth. A somewhat similar occurrence took place in my own neighborhood very recently. A lady, going to make a morning's call, passed the gateway of a house, when her gown was seized by a dog, who pulled her the contrary way to which she was going. She at last disengaged herself and made her call. On coming out, the dog was waiting for her, and again took her gown in his mouth and led her to the gateway she had previously passed. Here he stopped, and as the dog held a tight hold, she rang the bell, and on a servant opening the gate, the animal, perfectly satisfied, trotted in, when she found that he belonged to the house, but had been shut out. It may be also mentioned as an instance of courage and fidelity in a terrier, that as a gentleman was returning home, a man armed with a large stick seized him by the breast, and striking him a violent blow on the head, desired him instantly to deliver his watch and money. As he was preparing to repeat the blow, the terrier sprung at him and seized him by the throat. His master at the same time Giving the man a violent blow, he fell backwards and dropped his stick. The gentleman took it up and ran off, followed by his dog. But not before the animal had torn off and carried away in his mouth a portion of the man's waistcoat. End of chapter 15